that he was out of shape. But he worked really, really hard at it. He spent a lot of time that people just didn't see. George was never a hard liver when his boxing career was over. It wasn't like he was into drugs or drinking. He didn't smoke. So even though he was in his late 30s, he was able to mount this comeback because he was serious. However serious he was about his resurrection as a fighter, Foreman came under heavy criticism. Oh my goodness, why is he doing this? He's beating up people that clearly aren't very good. Why is he tarnishing his whole boxing career? It was a sideshow. There was this big, fat old guy who was barely a shell of his old self. There was one person on earth who took George Foreman's comeback seriously, and that was George Foreman. I showed people that, hey, you're 38 years old, 39, 40, whatever they want to give you, it doesn't mean that I'm dead or you dead. You don't listen to critics. So what? I'm out of, I had a little extra weight on. So what? He sort of looked like his feet were entrenched in cement. And he had an armadillo defense. But he could still hit, and the last thing that goes is power. I remember in one conversation that we had, he said, you know, you can be a water truck or you can be a fire truck. If you're a water truck that goes by and nobody notices anything, I choose to be a fire truck with the siren going and the, and the lights flashing so people will notice me. F. Scott Fitzgerald said that there are no second acts in American public lives. More so than anyone else, George Foreman disproved that. He entirely remade himself from this specter of evil into Santa Claus. And no one else in American history has accomplished as complete a transformation. I said, what changed you? So he said, when I decided to come back to boxing, I decided that I wanted to be liked. And in order to be liked, you have to like. He had a plan, and I think that he needed years for it to mature, and, it, and he gave it time to breathe. It's like a great artist going out there and thinking, okay, I'm thinking about this sculpture. I don't know exactly what it's gonna be yet, but it's formulated in his mind, and he literally resculpted himself. To show the whole world that the age 40 or 50 is not a death sentence. We're gonna celebrate and drink our Jerry Tall and eat our hamburgers. He made jokes of himself. He used to say that Evander Holyfield had a nutritionist. He had room service. Uh, his trainers were named Baskin and Robbins. It's gonna be big buffet set up. I'm gonna train hard every day and walk through there and grab legs of chicken, roast of beef, porks of chops. He would make believe he would be eating with the hamburgers, junk food and everything. But the guy knew what to do, what to eat. He knew how to play the crowd. He encouraged the laughter. He would sort of uh, tempt them to make fun of him. And when I miss Alison Rodriguez with my right hand, then my left, I'm going to belly bump him. <laughs> He's going to be in trouble. They look at me and they say, he reminds me of old grandpa, old uncle so-and-so. They've got to cheer for me because if they cheer against me, they're cheering against their own grandpa. In April of 1991, with a generation of baby boomers in rapt attention, 42-year-old Foreman fought heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield. If there were any remaining doubts about the legitimacy of George's chances, he may have erased them in the last 30 seconds. I thought George went about as far as he could go when he fought Evander Holyfield. And he fought a very brave fight. Although the 28-year-old champion kept his title by winning a unanimous 12-round decision, Foreman in no way resembled the loser he had been 17 years earlier in Kinshasa. And he went in there and was extremely competitive with Evander Holyfield, had a chance to win the fight. And I think that's when people said, hey, boy, if we didn't know it before, this guy is really legit and he really can fight. He's now proved himself going into the cauldron against the heavyweight champion nearly winning and he's reinforced his nice guy image heartfelt as it was in the ring we now have become fans of his 
George completely became what he needed to be in order to be loved, to be liked, to be adored, and to be successful. Assuming for a moment that he was, in fact, searching all his life for respect, he has hit the pot on the other side of the rainbow. There was a calculated transition. The same way as I knew that he wasn't his monster in his first life, I also knew that he wasn't exactly this uh, guy handing out apples on a corner stand. I don't think people totally change. Right under the surface of George is probably somebody who is not totally at ease, it's always slightly suspicious. If you watch carefully, when the cameras aren't rolling and he thinks people aren't watching, uh, he, he's still got that, that side to him that says, don't tread on me. George Foreman is not Santa Claus. He is not a guy you want to cross. There was nobody around, and a pretty well-known boxing trainer patted him on the belly and said, George, you're putting a little weight on there. And George Foreman just like, walked right past him and said, don't be effing with me, Richie. Don't you be effing with me. And he didn't say F. He put all the letters in there. I was thinking, that doesn't sound like the Reverend George Foreman that I've come to know. George Foreman is a con artist. He's been able to plaster that grin on his face and do very well for himself. And George Foreman is a performer. He, he's somebody who lights up and activates for the moment. And, uh, you know, the, the camera comes on and it's as though uh, a separate circuit has turned on in George's body. The big smile lights up, and, and that smile alone has been worth hundreds of millions of dollars to him. Right in the middle of his comeback, George makes the cover of Forbes magazine, not as a boxer, not as a heavyweight contender, but as a businessman. In 1999, George Foreman hit the jackpot. He signed a $137.5 million agreement to help market the George Foreman Lean Mean Grilling Machine. The ex-champ turned preacher has also earned millions more, endorsing other products from meat to mufflers. George Foreman ranks in the top 25 of all time in terms of total money taken in from athlete endorsements. He used to make $25,000 a year when he was a heavyweight champion, and now he makes more than $25,000 a day. Boxers traditionally have a hard time being commercially marketable in terms of products and going beyond the fringes of boxing. George Foreman changed that to a great extent because he became um, very marketable, and he did it through his personality. He learned from Muhammad Ali he saw what Ali did and the way people viewed him, and he saw how he was viewed after he got beaten by Ali. People really didn't want anything to do with him because he was this sort of hard guy. So when he decided to come back, you know, he changed his whole modus operandi. I had to learn it the hard way. I'd be an evangelist on the street, and people would pass me by. I had to start talking and selling what I believed in. And I'm, I'm sold now. I can sell anything. For someone who had come a long way from those lean days in Houston's Fifth Ward, one dream remained unrealized. Then, in 1994, 20 years after losing to Muhammad Ali, Foreman, at 45, got a last shot at redeeming himself in the ring when he faced heavyweight champ Michael Moore. He was a haunted guy. But from that moment in, in Zaire, his, uh, Ali was... A, a, a ghost living in his head. He kept indicating all week he had to erase what happened in Zaire. What was most interesting about his comeback in terms of him as a fighter, you saw the inner qualities he had as an athlete that were not apparent during his first career. And that was just how determined and tough a man he is. Foreman was losing every minute of every run. It wasn't really a competitive fight. Solid right hand by Moore. Foreman's left eye beginning to close. For those of us at ringside and working press are turning each other and going, what's holding this guy up? Uppercut by Moore, 
blasted Foreman's chin backward. There was this resignation in the crowd because they realized, hey, he's not going to win the fight. This is the end of the line. And then all of a sudden comes that punch out of nowhere. does and just standing in front of him. You know, big hamburger eating, grinning George, you know, I won't, I won't do nothing to you, I'm old. He was able to con him to a certain extent to stand there, to feel comfortable. He said, my whole idea the whole night was to invite him in, like a, a, a he wanted the fly to come to the web and make him more confident. I could take his punches all night. All I needed was one shot. He said to me, what do you think of the fight? And I said, well, you know, you lost every minute. He said, yeah, that's just the way I figured it. I lost every minute until I knocked him out. When George pulls it off, the entire place erupts. Goes absolutely nuts. People were just screaming out, can you believe what George Foreman has accomplished? When he knocks out Michael Moore to regain the championship, he is wearing the red trunks he wore in the ring against Muhammad Ali in Zaire. He has now come all the way back. He was better than Muhammad Ali the night that they fought, but he lost the world title. Now here was a guy maybe who was better than him, and he got the title back, so he kind of evened the score. I don't think there's any accomplishment like that that you can find anywhere else in sports. I once heard somebody ask whether it was just as impressive for Jack Nicklaus to win the Masters at age 46, as it was for George Foreman to win the heavyweight championship at age 45. And this person stated the obvious. Nobody was hitting Jack. While the rest of us were celebrating his victory, George made his way out about 2 a.m. Sunday morning, got into his limo, went to the airport, flew to Houston so that he could preach in his church the following morning. Within a year, the fighting preacher was stripped of his WBA title for not facing the top contender. In 1997, Foreman finally quit the ring with 76 wins and five losses. It had been a drama in two acts. In the first half of his career, he tried desperately to be Sonny Liston. In the second half, he tried to be Muhammad Ali, and somehow he pulled them both off. He exhibited such human qualities when the second George Foreman emerged, that the first George Foreman was really forgotten. And I didn't think George was a bad guy, the first one. I thought he needed love, and I thought he had to find himself, you know, and he did that. George had many sides and showed some of them to the world. And I'm sure there are many Georges that we haven't seen. One of the reasons that we seem to love George so much is because we know that he is still the monster. He can still pulverize us. And yet, in choosing not to, he makes us feel good.